Welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series, your resource for the latest news and updates on pressing issues facing the accounting profession. Good afternoon and welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series. I'm Eric Auskerson, one of your hosts for today. And as you can see, we're coming to you live from Digital CPA in Austin, Texas. It's great to be here in person. Great to be here in person, Eric. No question about it. Good to be with everybody here. And this is a great event, but we've got a lot of things happening as well. We've world. got a, an action-packed hour, uh, a power hour, as we like, like to say. So we're going to kick things off with a DC and profession update. Then we're going to move to talk about the FTX bankruptcy, provide you an overview, have a discussion around that. Then we're going to go into technical updates. We're going to have a human capital discussion with the AICPA chair. And then we're going to have the digital CPA chair here to provide some perspectives about his firm and, and, and what's going on here at the conference. And then we'll close with open forum. So here's the lineup of presenters. And Barry, we're going to kick things off uh, and talk about we're in Texas, uh, but there's, there's an election runoff in Georgia. Yeah, and it's an important one. You know, everybody sort of, I think, has sort of brought down their expectations on this race a little bit because it's, it's clearly there's already 50 Democratic seats in the Senate. Um, but the reality is there's a huge difference between 50-50 or 51 and 49. And just to give you a little bit of a context in this election, both of these candidates combined, although Warren, Warnock, two to one, more than Walker, raised collectively $73 million from October 20th until about um, the middle of November. So it is intense and we'll see how it comes out. One of the key components on why it makes a difference, by the way, is um, we've talked a lot about in town halls in the last two years about how important um, Senator Manchin, for instance, or Senator Sinema, in their opinion, it was on a lot of these different issues because how they thought made a difference if the, if the Democrats could get to 50-50. Um, if it's 51-49 Democrats, then that sort of relationship changes for them. Um, and of course, we're going to have a Republican House. And so, you know, we got this whole issue about what can really get through the, the, the congressional system with a divided, you know, a Republican House and effectively a Democratic Senate. Well, we, we were talking about this in, in 2020 uh, with the last runoff, and we're just going to find out a little bit sooner. But So... We still have a, a lame duck session uh, for the remainder of this year. And there's a number of bills that we've been talking about here in the town hall. So let's kind of touch so, base on current status. So the National Defense Authorization Act is something that has to pass before the end of the year. And it has passed in the last part of the year for 61 straight years. Think about that, 61 straight years. That's a long time. Uh, it's inevitable it gets sort of wrapped into the, into the, uh, into the end of the process. It, it is political and it's massive. And we all know one of the key components of the, of the federal government is national defense. So you can, understand, you can understand that. And then there's an omnibus bill that sort of ties into a continuing resolution that's out there. Um, so we had a, the funding the government versus shutting down the government. We got to about the middle of December um, for that to be worked out. Probably they won't get to the omnibus bill and funding the government into the end of the next fiscal year. And they'll probably do a short term, what's called CR, a continuing resolution that um, would in, in fact fund the government maybe for like a week or something before they can actually get all the work necessary for an omnibus bill. If that fails, then you're gonna see a continuing resolution that might push it into February and March. And that would, um, fund the government for that time, and then you'd have sort of a cliff notion of, of the sort of the staring down match of whether or not government closes at that point. At this point, we think both of these will pass. There's a lot of high level negotiations on the omnibus bill. And as it relates to the profession, some of the important things to understand in this is first, in the omnibus bill, probably there will be some opportunities for certain tax types of things that will get put into it. So for instance, tax extenders, we talk about that a lot in the town halls. There's always a, a, a package of tax extenders that have expired and they need to be extended and it takes congressional action to do it. An omnibus bill is a place that they'll probably do that. So this year, that's things like R&D, that's things like child, um, child credit, um, 
that is in, that's set to expire. So we would expect that you might see some things in there. There's also the opportunity for some retirement provisions. There are three different bills in Congress that have been moving on either the House or the Senate on looking at the retirement, the tax and, and support of retirement programs. Um, they're all over the place. I'll give you some sense of, of what there might be, but those are gonna probably be compromised. And if it passes, it's gonna probably pass as part of the omnibus bill. But things that are being debated and if it passes will probably be in that is something like moving the required minimum distribution age from 70 and a half to something else. In one bill it's 72 and one it's 73. Uh, so that's, that's likely to pass. Um, some reauthorization on uh, some catch up uh, contributions to retirement plans. Uh, some authorization to be able to pull money out of retirement plans in the case of emergencies. That's a potential that that could be in that, uh, in that situation. So those are very, you know, obviously very important to the tax planning process and to the to tax administration. And then the, and another one I'll just mention, I won't mention all of them, but uh, cannabis legislation. And in this case, a provision about financial services. And, you know, our profession has been a difficult spot. We have so many states that have um, legalized cannabis, but technically it's still illegal at a federal level. And so when you do those services, you're technically potentially putting yourself at risk. And many CPAs are providing those services, but it's a state by state issue and it's a little complicated. So if that were to pass, it would not just for us, but it'd be a broad language that would give some protection where the, the federal versus the state might not be aligned that you could still do that type of work. And I know that's very important to a lot of firms. A few things going on. <laughs> in a short period of time. In a short time. period of time, we will we'll give a, an update on all of this on the next town hall in, in a couple of weeks. In addition to all of that potential lame duck legislation, a lot of talk about the, the new Republican House um, conducting a lot of oversight hearings. Yes, yeah, so let's remember the majority for the Republicans in the House is about the same size as the majority of the Democrats were for the last two years. So it's narrow. Uh, some of you who are regulars in the town halls, you know that with retirements and sickness and things of that nature, at some points in the last two years, the Democratic majority was uh, at, at some points even like two or three seats uh, with people actually present in Washington. So it's going to start out probably around 10 when it's all said and done with the Republicans. And that's about what the Democrats had for the last two years. Now, the biggest change on that is that all of the committees of Congress and the subcommittees, the gavel switches. So a Republican will have the gavel, which means what is the agenda? When are the hearings? Who's you know, really invited or requested to testify at these hearings? Most importantly of that is what are the agenda items? And you can see a bunch of bullet points on this slide. Um, the reality is, is that some of those are going to fall into the political bucket, like the handling of Afghanistan and uh, some of the, uh, the White House issues and things of that nature. Some of it's going to fall into uh, some business issues, which we're going to talk about um, FTX here in a moment. Um, all of those things you will hear and see a lot of hearings. Now, they're going to look different in the Senate. And so that's going to take a lot of the oxygen in Washington, these hearings, which means what you're going to see in the next two years is going to be even you know, more difficult to get through the system than it was and not a lot passed in the last two years, even with the Democrats in control of both houses. Well, to conclude uh, the DC update, you know, the latest related to the commissioner nominee for the IRS. Yeah, so Danny Werfel, we know, uh, Danny was actually in, a, in about eight years ago was acting commissioner of the IRS. Um, he had a he had a very significant role um, in the uh, Office of Management and Budget (OMB) in a controller role, uh, and then he had a he had a project manager role, a project which is not like a project management, but it was a management role, uh, and actually wore both of those hats for a period of time. And when you go back in history into 2013, you many of you will remember the the Lois Lerner issue in which the IRS was. Um, criticized for what was perceived by some to be favorable treatment as it related to not-for-profits, political treatment, if you will, the politicization of the IRS. And he was brought in when all of that was coming down to bring some stability uh, to the IRS. Um, and, and before a new permanent IRS commissioner about eight or nine months later was actually um, appointed. 
And so we had an opportunity during that interim commissionership that he had to work with him. And one of the key, and this will be, I think, music to the ears of a lot of our, our members, one of the key issues on that we worked with him on was services. And it was a budget issue for the IRS because of the politicization issue. There was a lot of attempts and there was some success of reducing the budget to the IRS, which affected some of the, of the service issues, which of course we've, we've lived with all of that. But he comes to the table, he, he, in the last part of his career, he's been at Boston Consulting, um, managing big IT and customer service type of activities. And so if we think about some of the challenges we've had at the Internal Revenue Service, that could be a good, um, a good connection. Now, let's just set the table fairly here. The, you know, he's not gonna be able to do those things really quickly, and it's not gonna be something we're gonna experience as necessarily a better situation in this coming tax filing season. So Lisa, I'll turn to you, and, and, and maybe you can help um, give a little bit of comfort of what we might be doing to help on some of those service issues for, for particularly smaller firms. Thanks, Barry. So, uh, spoiler alert, not a lot of, um, Progress is going to be made in 2023 filing season. We don't expect. But longer term, we've got our advocacy team working on looking at what things can we advocate for that can make life simpler during tax season, such as simplifying the extension process and um, maybe automating that extension process somehow. So what other ways can we make life better during busy season without um, getting into the process of, of changing due dates. We've talked about that in the past. We talked about it on the last town hall. And I'll talk about a little more in some of the more short-term ideas that we've got for you when we get into some of my, the other slides. And, and one of the key components, and, and I know we've said it many times, but I'm gonna repeat it because as I interact with members of some here at this conference, they, they don't all recognize where a big piece of where we are advocating on that. We are strong proponents and we lead, a, we lead a coalition that is in favor of it, of other preparer communities to have a concentrated preparer unit inside the IRS that would be a resource so that tax, professional tax preparers can access the IRS in a different way. We've been an advocate of that for a while. It has not gotten set up. And you know, when he's ultimately confirmed, which we think he will, and his history with the Lewis Lerner issue will cause it probably to take a little bit longer to get through the Senate, but we think he'll get, get confirmed. Um, that will be something that'll be front and center in some of our early discussions with him. And our team is looking at um, having conversations with the IRS around where we would like to see that $80 billion in new funding spent, you know, balancing it between right. the taxpayer services. And, and just one last point on that, and we'll move off of the DC update. Uh, we are strong advocates that a part of that money be put to services. However, uh, in today's environment, there are there are voices in Washington that do not support that. They don't, and and it's not so much they don't support additional service, but they don't support the level of funding that was put forward to the IRS. And so, politically, if they see an opportunity to roll some of that back, that would be their political position. So it's not a slam dunk from that standpoint. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. We've got we've got a few more sections in today's town hall, so we're gonna we're gonna keep going, and we're now gonna introduce Ron Quanta, who leads the Wall Street Wall Street Blockchain Alliance. He's been a partner of the AICBANCPA.com for the past five plus years. We've held a lot of blockchain symposiums, so we asked Ron to join today's town hall to help uh, explain, you know, what has happened based on, Ron, what we know. What we do here at the town hall, we bring the best available information. So there's things that we know, there's plenty that we don't know. So with that, uh, I'll let you uh, kind of walk through the next couple of slides. Eric, thanks a lot. Really great to be here. And thanks once again for the least controversial topic in the news lately. <laughs> there you go. I, I mean, when you look at what's happened with FTX, I really want to level set a little bit by understanding what I've considered to be the two major players. One was a firm you've probably all heard, Alameda Research, which is a trading firm, started about five years ago. They alleged some early success in arbitrage and crypto. Uh, within a couple of years of that, the team at Alameda decided to create what we now know as FTX, which operated as an international exchange headquartered in the Bahamas. And they really, at least in the beginning, said they were focusing on derivatives, this institutional level engagement. Uh, and to that point, they became the second largest crypto exchange by 2021. Uh, and one sidebar to that, uh, for U.S. citizens, they separately created 
FTX US, which was meant to be a legal regulated entity uh, in the United States. And it's interesting in the wake of this, how this all collapsed quickly. Uh, so next slide, please. So I think one of the things to, to speak on about the bankruptcy, and let me talk a little bit about what, what particularly happened very briefly. Those two firms, Alameda Research and FTX, uh, which would arguably have had an arm's length relationship, um, were much more integrated than most people knew. Uh, indeed, uh, much of the balance sheet of Alameda was based on tokens created by the exchange. And again, this is just based on information that we know. Uh, and as some of their investments and trades uh, lost significant amounts of money, uh, it seems to be the case that the exchange was taking customer funds and depositing it to Alameda. The upshot of that became in a series of allegedly leaked financials, uh, which were uh, an interesting thing to look at. Uh, it, uh, the public became aware that these tokens uh, were too much a part of the balance sheet of both of these firms, which initiated this kind of bank run on crypto in a way. I, I always hesitate to use the word bank run. They are not remotely a bank. But in the collapse of that token led to this ripple effects because, because that token was used as collateral with clients around the world and in their inability to meet the demands for withdrawals. FTX, by way of example, closed and uh, filed for bankruptcy, I think, within seven business days. Um, so, Barry, I know you and I have talked about this as well, and there's a lot of conversation around the impact to crypto. What is the material failure conversation for us has always been, this is a failure of controls and governance, and there are links that show articles talking very specifically about this. And there are others that really look at it and not necessarily saying I hold this opinion that is a potentially a regulatory failure. Um, Barry, thoughts about that? Well, there's certainly a lot of voices saying different types of regulation, and this this was a this was a private company, and and I think, um, you know, the Bahamas. With a lot of this was in the Bahamas, and and there was 130 different companies allegedly involved in this process, and so the if, if we had the Bahamas leadership up here, they'd say, yeah, we were regulating it, but, um, and, and in fact, you mentioned the U.S. entity which had more um, separateness to it, apparently. We don't know that yet, but uh, that's at least some of the reports. I think it's important also as part of this is that it's been reported by a lot of news medias, uh, a lot of news media that, that a lot of the uh, information flow was about internal financial information, not external financial information. And we, we're gonna have a link for you and from some of those news uh, uh, places. And there's something that uh, has been linked that's called a balance sheet, and I'll let all of you take a look at it to see all of the, the accountants on the on the town hall to see if you think it's a balance sheet or not. But there's some interesting nomenclature on there. For instance, um, again, this is an internal, not an external financial statement, but a, allegedly uh, people were working with these numbers. But they, the asset character there was columnar, and there was asset categorizations that were called liquid assets, less liquid assets, illiquid assets. And you might, you might find it interesting, like sort of, a, sort of stuck at the bottom, um, there was an account called hidden, poorly internally labeled fiat account. And the balance in that, by the way, was eight, negative $8 billion. Um, so, uh, and then there was a subtext on that, withdrawals on Sunday of five, billion dollars. And so, it, again, we, you know, a lot of stuff's got to play out on this, but there was clearly some questions about where, where was, what financial information was being used in this process. Absolutely. And I think one of the additional commentaries to be made about that prior to their bankruptcy, uh, and again, we don't work with FTX, but FTX re reflected themselves as, um, in the wake of crypto winter, these kind of white knights. They were coming in, they offered to buy another bankrupt uh, platform called Voyager, um, now that's failed, obviously, because FTX is, is bankrupt. So Voyager looking for a new acquirer in the wake of that BlockFi, which is an entirely different type of organization, uh, a lending platform that spent a lot of time being compliant and with licensing, um, now has to file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. So the concern becomes how far does this contagion go? There's conversations about other organizations, Digital Currency Group and Genesis Trading. So. You know, I tend to be very optimistic in the crypto space, but we have to uh, wait for the next sheet to drop. Yeah, and, and I'm sorry, but part of that people were calling what it, and FTX ended up being somewhere relating it to what JP Morgan, the man, actually did in the early 1900s to stabilize an American economy. We found out that probably wasn't the case in this place.
Indeed. And so, Ron, we're going to move and talk a little bit about the regulatory and legislative responses, which already are occurring. There's already been an FTX hearing. That's right. So maybe for the audience here, we got some questions coming in. We got we got close to seven thousand people uh, online with us, and I think everybody can hear the uh, the studio audience. Uh, when you look at these hundred and thirty different entities, you know what 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 was happening here is they had to run, and you understand the the, the digital asset market. They had to set up these entities to kind of support some of those exchanges. And if you were in the U.S., you you went to FTX.us, but a lot of people tried to go to the the FTX international site, because that's where some very sophisticated derivative trading was occurring. So this actually, you know, what they were doing was was something that a lot of institutional investors were taking advantage of. Yeah, I mean, there is this real opportunity, if you're knowledgeable enough, to get around uh, being routed to FTX.us to engage, you know, VPN and other capabilities with these overseas entities, potentially in violation of law. Right. Depending uh, depending on the venue and depending on, on on the entity itself. But that being said, all of those entities uh, interact, and it's really an interesting diagram. We don't have it here, um, but it's worth looking up because so many of them had IOU to other entities. So many of them had tokens that were rehypothecated to other corporate entities within the FTX structure. So once that began to fall down, you can literally see the ripple effect of firms that had to file under the umbrella of of FTX Limited, the global entity itself. So here, I mean, this is something that the town hall attendees can just take away. A lot of different activities underway, maybe one or two that you want to comment on. Yeah, I mean, certainly there was the, the, you, the suspected outrage by, by regulators in the United States and, and overseas. I would argue there's still a little bit of a lack of understanding fully of crypto knowledge, but that's certainly changing. You and Barry mentioned there'll be hearings on the Hill. I think, uh, if I remember correctly, the former CEO of FTX will be uh, testifying on December 13th. Uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission, which has been very strongly focused on, um, I don't want to use the phrase regulation by enforcement, but I will, will certainly put forward more regulatory actions uh, you know, as we move uh, this forward. But the conversation really becomes how much of this can be alleviated over time with a true regulatory framework that addresses some of these instruments. So what's next here? Education is key. There's, there's a lot that, that the audience can read. Barry, I wanted to just go to you and, and ask, I mean, you, you've seen uh, a lot of these market failures over, over your career in the leadership role uh, at, at the AICPA. So maybe just, just some broader thoughts on, because we don't know, there's a lot that everyone's trying to understand right now. Uh, we have experts like Ron, we're sharing the best available information we have, but maybe just kind of reflect more broadly. Yeah, first off, in this, you know, as in a broad sense, we actually have been, you know, saying that there was, as Ron just articulated, the need for additional regulation in this space, and um, and you know, obviously, some of that will, will come about. Um, the other side of this is that you know, as a profession, financial information, and I just talked about internal financial information, but you know, the profession will be um, brought in to some degree, you know, litigation and all types of things that happen in these in these types of things. Um, I do think that in this case that what we will see is some movement to greater regulation, which we will find ways to support and make work from the standpoint of what the role of the profession is going forward. And I think that's the real key uh, in this environment. You know, I've lived through, yes, Enron and WorldCom in 2008, and, but even before that, economic downturns of the, of the 80s and then the 70s, et cetera, um, you know, there's been different involvement of the profession. And I think in this case, with these 130 com country um, companies, excuse me, or 129 of them apparently, not in the U.S., I think there's a really significant different fact pattern that plays out um, in this space. But as you said, you know, the the details have to be um, figured out. And Ron, I'll, what we'll probably do is bring you back in the future town hall, to, and you do this well to, to look at the state of where. And this is not block blockchain is much bigger, correct? Than digital assets, crypto, whatever, you know, that, that category. Um, but maybe just a close, closing uh, remark. Yeah, real, real quickly, and, and obviously this is a fast-moving ecosystem. Literally, as soon as we get off the stage, there'll be additional news that I'll probably have to review. But I, I do want to just one thing that Barry mentioned, and we talk about it here, proof of reserves coming to the fore. For, for the accounting profession, proof of reserves, in my mind, is a real opportunity. Because proof of reserves is meant to be a technical solution to is what they say they carry, available in those accounts, available on the blockchain, but they still need trusted providers to provide them that information. 
So I would argue the accounting profession is well placed to leverage that trusted provider status for things like proof of reserves. Well said. So thank you, Ron. Thank, thank you. you very much. We look forward to having you back at a, at a future town hall. We're now going to move to uh, technical updates, and we've got a couple of other sections after that. All right, let's get started. So I thought we'd start with some tax talk, and we are going to start with good news. There are revised K2, K3 draft instructions that came out just last week. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail, but it's always good to start with a positive. Then I'm going to sandwich that with IRS service levels and ERC, and then we'll come back to something. Um, so we got, you know, let's start with the positive and go through some negatives. Um, we talked a little bit about service levels. We are continuing to um, push for enhanced service, but we're hearing some information from some of you about a new issue with payments not being applied to um, accounts properly. So Brian, I'll give you a call out. Thanks for letting us know about what you've got going on. But I, I wanted to ask the others in the audience, if you've got those issues that have come back up, and this is not the issue where um, the, a spousal payment was not being applied, but if you've got an issue like that, let us know through the Q&A. That insight is really helpful and helps us get some direction to dig in with the IRS. Employee retention credits, the IRS is still focused on some of those aggressive ERC mills that are out there. Um, a 72-page training manual for IRS employees was recently um, made available, and we understand that there are about 300 agents who've been trained on ERC. The, the training material that came out is very much focused on on basics, so we'll be looking to see if, if they go into a deeper level of training. But again, as a warning to your clients, I know y'all don't need to hear it, but there are you know criminal actions being um, investigated at the IRS, so just something to, to keep your eye on. I'll refer you back to our ERC resource library for some of the great materials that we have there. And then a new issue that um, we are hearing more and more about is a 1099K conversation. So on that first slide, I've given you a link to some of the, the resources that we have, but much more to come. So as a, as a reset, under the ARPA, which came out in March of 2021, the threshold for reporting information on a third-party network, such as Venmo, PayPal, et cetera, was dramatically reduced to $600 regardless of the number of transactions. And that is effective for this tax year. So those 1099Ks will be filed in January of 2023. So this is gonna be um, a, a pain point, we believe, because a lot of your clients are accepting payments through Venmo, PayPal, et cetera, and are not aware that they're gonna get this 1099K. So they may not tell you about it, when they're bringing their information in, or they may not, you know, may have made adequate estimated tax filings if they're running like a side hustle or something like that. So within our teams, we'll be developing some client communications for you. Um, that'll include our tax section Odyssey podcast. So we'll make sure that you all get that link when it comes out. And we'll be updating some articles in the Journal of Accountancy and Tax Advisor. But again, getting out in, in front of this with your clients is going to be really important. Yeah, Lisa, I think this is a big issue that's going to be a practice management issue, clearly. Um, communicating with the client is going to be important. Um, you know, it, it could also be a service level issue from the IRS if there's some kind of matching process where somebody didn't bring in their uh, 1099K. Um, there's going to be issues of what is the basis on some of these things. Uh, it's, going to get, it's going to get complicated. And the $600 is not supposed to include things like if you use Venmo to reimburse a shared lunch or dinner or things of that nature, or even for a gift. But it depends on how people characterize those types of things. This is really part of a bigger, a bigger digitization of the economy issue. And frankly, the US economy, as far as the connectivity of all of those things is behind some of the other places in the world. So Europe and Asia, et cetera, where this complete you know, cashless society is much more um, closer to reality. 
Um, and you know, as we see this being used with these sort of sharing apps and things of that nature, it's gonna come in. But from a tax practice management perspective, it's not gonna be fun because your clients that are in, do some of these things, and you, it's not just people who are in this business, but you know, I'll just give a couple of examples. Like you, you have tickets to sporting events and you sell it on Ticketmaster, that's gonna be a reportable type of transaction as an example. And so um, it's gonna be, and younger people may be selling things on eBay and things of that nature. So it, it's, going to be, it's going to be complex. This is law. This is not IRS interpretation. And I think it's important to understand that. This was acted by Congress. And actually, one of the things we're communicating to the members of Congress is that they're going to get a lot of complaints from their individual constituents on this point. And it, and it really isn't the IRS that's implementing this. I mean, the IRS is implementing the law, so it's not like they've changed some threshold um, unilaterally as the, as the service. And so I, I think this needs to be high on people's radar screen. And the IRS has said that if there is an issue with the 1099K that the taxpayer received, take it to the, take it to the third party network, not the IRS. So again, we'll, we'll get you more information and develop some resources for you through our tax teams. Okay, so good news around K2K3, which is the um, set of forms that are used to report items of international tax significance for partnership and S Corp entities. Back in October, um, an, a set of draft instructions came out and caused quite a bit of, to put it politely, consternation because there was a notification requirement that was going to require the partnership the tax preparer to notify partners two months in advance of the filing deadline, the March 15 filing deadline, if they um, were going to report on a K2, K3. K3, that was going to create an incredible burden for our, our tax preparers. We have been strongly, strongly advocating for um, a, a more reasonable approach to this. We had just submitted a comment letter on November 30th, and then um, December 2nd, we got these new instructions. And this is really good news around this notification requirement. So um, if there is no or limited foreign activity, and there are only U.S. citizen or resident partners, then the partnership can skip the K2K3 and report out that um, they're just gonna include a notice on the K-1 as an attachment to the K-1 that they're not gonna furnish the K-3. Um, and they can't, the, the partnership has until one, until the filing of the partnership return with the um, partners. So if the partnership does not receive a request from a partner for that K-3 on or before one, the one month date, um, then they don't have to fill out the K2K3, which is another burdensome requirement. So the one month date is one month before the partnership files the form 1065. And a big improvement since the last set of instructions is that that one month date applies to um, the extended date. So it can be up until August 15. So this is a, a huge win for you. And um, I do wanna give a special shout out to our advocacy team for all the work they've done on that. We have a ton of resources that I wanted to point out to you around tax season readiness. So you'll see a bunch of great links there just to help you get ready. But I, I have to call out this reimagining your tax practice team that um, work stream that we have that has great interactive sessions for you. You'll see the topics there. We've got two more coming up, but it's very important that you know you can access those recordings as well, and we've got a great one on pivoting your business model that Jody Grandin was on. Um, we have a new resource around lease accounting. If you've got some clients who've been digging their head in the sand and ignoring it, you've got a resource there for you. And then super quick, um, Restaurant Revitalization Fund released a, additional funding. I've heard no news about how it went, so if any of your clients got that funding, just give us a heads up and let us know. Well, a new... Uh Ameta, our, our AICPA chair, it's great to have you here with us at Digital CPA. So I know human capital has been uh, top of mind for you. So 
Let's yeah. have some well, opening comments. Well, first of all, Eric, it is fantastic to be here. I, I tell you, I've been here for the last two days, and the energy um, is amazing. And actually, you know, all the conferences that I've ever attended, um, meetings and whatnot, it is actually strange to find everyone that's younger than you <laughs> at this thing. Well, almost younger because Barry's here, hey, but that's okay. <laughs> Um, There's a lot of energy here. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I, it is uh, truly exciting to be here and, and uh, be with you. Yeah. So, um, you know, I tell you, I've been going around and uh, um, talking to a lot of folks. And one of the things that uh, constantly comes up is uh, retention, you know, of talent, finding the talent, retaining them. Um, how do we advance? And I tell you, I still remember, um, you know, when I became chair in May, one of the things I emphasized was that uh, we need to take a people first approach and uh, people should be at the center of all our decisions. And, and, you know, I know, Barry, you talked about this too, how we take care of human capital, um, how we continue to provide flexibility, um, advancement opportunities, create that purpose that's so vital. Um, and I'll tell you, if you look at uh, in firms, organizations, top performers, what are they looking for? Um, especially, you know, with Gen Ys and Gen Zs, uh, they need to know that their work matters, and that is critical. Um, they want an opportunity to grow. They want an opportunity to, um, they want leaders to invest in them. Um, so this is really uh, incredible, uh, you know, the insight that I've gained from it. And Barry, actually, yesterday you made a point uh, in your early career, you know, you were working with a firm. Uh, you wanted to help client. You wanted them to meet with you a lot, uh, you know, more times uh, so that you can add value to them. And that's what our young professionals are looking for, to be able to provide value and, and see their career grow. And in fact, I know, um, you know, this morning, Marcus touched on that, which was, I think, uh, really very relevant. And I found it very profound that... Um, you know, employees don't need uh, to enjoy 100% of the things that they do. 20% is all they need, right? So I think those are some of my observations in, in, in as far as advancing this. Yeah, and Anoop, you're right on on all of that, and it is a huge issue. And it's not just our issue. It's, it's every sort of part of society. And by the way, it's not just a U.S. issue. It's all over the world, um, the, the changing demographics and the changing aspects of human capital. Um, and, and actually, we are working on a proposal with our, our friends at NASBA and, and the state regulators to um, help with sort of a marrying of the education requirements with some um, work experience and have it be scalable for smaller firms and things of that nature. And that's going to be, you know, being discussed in the next month and few months, if you will, and targeted for something new there by August. So that's a big deal. But I know in your travels, Anoop, you've been to a lot of college campuses and met with this next generation. And I agree that they're purpose driven, but you might want to just sort of give a couple of examples of some of the, some of the energy you're seeing in, you know, in the, in the classrooms or in the meetings around the classrooms, let's put it that way. Yeah. So um, it's been six months um, in May, since May. Um, and I tell you, it's been an experience of a lifetime um, meeting so many of our members, uh, students, faculty, state society um, leaders and staff. Uh, and I tell you, I couldn't be more proud of this profession. Um, seeing that passion about our profession from my dad, you know, I get a lot from my dad and now I'm living it, um, it is phenomenal. Um, like I said, I couldn't be more proud of this profession. So I've visited about 10 universities um, in the last four months. You know, September, they start, went back to school. Um, and I've spoken to about 2,500 students and uh, faculty members and, and actually, you know, firms that are around the universities and where they recruit from. Uh, and I know we talk a lot about pipeline. Um, and I to tell you something, uh, you know, I can't wait for these students to enter our profession. They have such a great passion. They, they have such a great drive. And uh, I, still, I think I still have another 10 universities that are on my calendar to visit. And so, you know, I know also we talk about um, student graduating in accounting and, you know, we find that 
uh, at least the data is showing that not many are sitting for the CPA. I tell you, that's not what I'm seeing. Um, if I was to estimate if nearly 90 to 95 percent of the accounting majors that I spoke to are going to be sitting for the CPA exam. That is exciting. Um, I'll tell you one, uh, I was in Puerto Rico. I spoke to 160 students, all accounting graduates, um, and nearly every single one of them was gonna sit for the CPA exam. Uh, last week I was in um, uh, uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, and tell you, there was a small group, I, I spoke to a larger group, and, but there was also a small group, about nine students, all minorities. And I, I went around and asked them, um, you know, when, how long did it take you to graduate? Well, let me tell you, with those nine, the average was 4.05 years. I did some calculations. And it was, it was remarkable. So I'm telling you, I was so impressed with their dedication, their drive. And, and they're willing to put in the effort. And so this is what really is exciting about our profession. And, and, and that's why I'm so passionate about it. Eric, before I turn it back to you, the point is the purpose of the profession has to be sold. And yes. Noob does a great job of doing that. The impact this profession does for entrepreneurs, for the capital market system, what, is, what resonates with this generation coming in is not a 40 year career and always having a job. It's the impact we make in society. Well, thank you, and Anoop, I enjoyed uh, talking to you about these travels. I mean, you are telling me about one presentation you gave, you had 750 students there. So thanks being out there in the field and, and, and bringing this message back to us. So what we're gonna do now, and we'll, we'll come back to you probably uh, during open forum, is we're gonna bring Jody uh, Grundin up, who's the CEO of the Summit CPA uh, Group, which is a division of Anders and he's also the digital CPA chair. Uh, Jody has been leading a virtual firm for the past decade. Uh, so he's not, he's already there in understanding how to support remote work because that's basically how he drove a lot of success at his practice. And the shirt he's wearing is not a digital CPA shirt. <laughs> <laughs> that's a personal brand. We're not gonna have time to get into that today, but we, we do have time to get into is some of the drivers of, of your firm. Now, thanks, Eric, for having me. Uh, it's been an honor to be the chair for the, uh, for the event here in Hawaii. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We're in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> now, with that, um, I, I think it's kind of important to kind of give you the, the background. We uh, started back in 2002 as a traditional brick and mortar uh, CPA firm, tax, tax returns, write-up work, that sort of thing. And then fast forward to 2022, uh, we ended up merging with a, a larger accounting firm, Andrews CPA and Advisors, out of St. Louis. And so kind of the, the journey there, it wasn't a traditional uh, CPA firm merger. You know, we, we started off with, uh, in 2002, with kind of changing the way that people thought, you know, or thinking about accounting. We wanted to do things a lot differently. Uh, working for a, a couple large uh, CPA firms, I realized quickly that that wasn't for me. Went to the corporate world, realized that wasn't for me either, and so I had no home. And so the... Uh, the best solution was to go and figure out and create my own home and our path. And so when my business partner, Adam Hale, and I, I started the, uh, the firm, you know, there's, there's a few things we wanted to get rid of. And uh, one thing was the appearance, we wanted to dress like the people that we were representing, which I thought was really important. Uh, we represent creative agencies, web design, web development, hence the shirt. Um, flat fee billing, we wanted to get rid of the hourly bill. Uh, we wanted to get rid of it completely because it just was kind of a, Pretty much, it was an antiquated system, we thought at that time. Uh, now we're, we're thinking that even more and more uh, today. And so we went to a flat fee billing process. We just basically took all of our tax returns, figured out a flat fee, and started charging it there. Um, that wasn't really satisfying, though. It, was, uh, it, it wasn't something that we just loved to come to work for. So we wanted to create something a little bit better. And so we created a, um, a value-based billing system with, where we actually could meet with the clients on a regular monthly basis at the time. And we had to figure out a way to, to price that because we didn't want to work hourly. And so we figured out a monthly bill. And uh, that, that really picked up. We called it the virtual CFO services at the time. Uh, we did that because we had no other idea what to call it. And so we looked at the thesauruses. We came up with that term and uh, that stuck. And, you know, what it meant was we were, we were really kind of working long term with the client. So it's CAS 2.0. Uh, so we were doing CAS 2.0 back in 2007. And then uh, clients wanted a little bit more. And so they were, hey, can you help out with the back office accounting, CAS 1.0? And 
And we started introducing that into the, into the program. So we went from CAS 2.0 to CAS 1.0, and about a third of our clients even today, uh, we do um, you know, back office accounting CAS 1.0 stuff. And so as it went through, uh, we had to figure out how to not be the bank. That was another thing we uh, uh, didn't, uh, didn't want to do. And so we uh, developed a subscription-based billing model back in 2007, uh, which we started billing clients and zapping their account every Monday. So I like to tell everybody Monday's my favorite day, still is today. <laughs> um, we grew to a $10 million firm, so you can divide that by 52. And uh, you know, with that, the subscription base wasn't just the billing thing. It was a, it was a way it was a, it was a thought process. We wanted to do really everything on the umbrella. So what we call virtual CFO could encompass a lot of things. It could encompass you know things such as you know profit you know profit you know basically developing a profit plan for clients. It could be banking relationships. It could be really kind of helping them with long term forecasts, short term forecasts. So really anything under the umbrella came up and just kind of fell in the lap. And we didn't build we didn't build separately for anything outside of the, uh, the, the program. So again, it, it just continued to accumulate. When we, um, we went to virtual CFO services, that was a, the big change in our, in our system there. And we, and we quit doing the remote or the standalone taxes. Again, we were brick and mortar at this time and just providing that service. The tax returns that we did provide were part of the service. So we didn't uh, really do anything outside of that. And then we got kind of cocky and we thought, you know, hey, can we do other things you know, inside of accounting? And so we thought, hey, let's do benefit plan audits. And we thought, well, that'd be kind of easy, right? Benefit plan audits, everybody can do that, right? <laughs> really difficult, just so you know. And uh, we started off with one, and we ended up having about 200 before uh, we uh, turned those over to Anders in, in April. So we really grew that practice super quick, again, fully remote. Um, and then we decided to uh, really kind of spread our wings a little bit. Our first CFO client was uh, one of the first 25 fully distributed uh, companies in the world. Uh, they had 65 employees on staff, and we kind of learned a lot about uh, how to work a, a completely remote, where I don't have an office to kind of fall back onto. And so in 2013-ish, somewhere in there, we decided, uh, hey, we're going to do it. And so we went fully remote. You know, 18 people um, decided to work from home, and uh, there's about four people that stayed in the office. We were pretty small at the time. And uh, we uh, kind of tested it out, and it really worked really well, and so well that we decided, you know, hey, let's kick off the uh, training wheels and just do this fully. And so with the four people that were in there moved, uh, basically worked, started working from home, and we were fully remote, got rid of the office, we didn't have anything to rely on, and we hired all across the nation. So we started really focusing on national hires, and we're hiring people that were trying to escape the public accounting view. They didn't want to work, you know, 50 hours a week during tax time or 60 or 70. They wanted to work a balanced lifestyle. And those were the folks that were, were coming and knocking on our door, which made it really easy to recruit nationally uh, because of the flexibility that our team had and, and you know, and the, the lifestyle itself. We, uh, when we went niched, uh, that's when our, our revenue really started uh, multiplying. We, we niched into the creative agency space in about 2010-ish, 11, somewhere in that ballpark. And uh, we, since then, we've doubled our revenue every three years. So huge growth over that period of time. Um, and, and what that allowed us to do is allowed us to change a lot of different things. We uh, went to a variable comp pay structure. Uh, and what that means, we gave our employees a base pay and then a variable comp based on the size of book that they were managing. And so that a person four years out of college could make the same as a person 12 years out of college if they're managing the same level of, um, you know, same level of book, which really eliminated any kind of, any, any kind of un, un, uh, you know, any kind of bias that we might have had going into it. And so there's a lot of things that we were doing differently. And you kind of can imagine when we came into a traditional accounting firm, you know, their eyes kind of, you know, opened up wide, like, wow, there's a lot of things we got to manage in order to make this successful. And that's where, uh, that's where the merger uh, talks start happening back in October of last year. And within about a six month period, we were able to wrap that up and uh, make it uh, with Robert uh, Minkler and uh, his, uh, his team at Anders. Well, um, that, was, that was an incredible overview there. And uh, one of the reasons why I encouraged you to kind of put this all down and, and you put together this, this, this story, this, this book basically about your firm, about, about this merger. So those of you online, you can download this ebook uh, that, was, that was written by Jody, highlights a lot of what he just discussed. And, when, and just two, two comments related to what you just discussed for the audience here. You know, your energy and purpose. I mean, that's what digital CPA is all about. You were talking about the human capital issue. Actually, here we've got over a thousand 
attendees, th th these 1,000 attendees, they are feeling very, very good about what they're doing and, and the success they're building. And that's the second point is your success. I think that's, that's, what, that's what Anders saw. So let's, let's hear a little bit about kind of your five wants in the merger. You could also call this the five things that you did to, to drive a successful merger with your staff. Yeah, there was, uh, there was five really key points that when we were talking merger, uh, what I felt was going to really make it the most effective way to continue on. And what I mean by that is what we didn't want to do is we didn't want to be absorbed. We didn't want to buy us for the human capital and then kind of do the regular stuff and everybody's working hourly and you know doing the, the regular CPA stuff. And we wanted to actually be able to take this unit, this, 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 this basically valuable tool, and really kind of blow it up. And we got the opportunity, like again, we're doubling our size every three years, and we've been consistently doing that, and, and again, uh, doing that even this year. Uh, with that, we, um, you know, how, how, how are we gonna continue doing that? Well, we have to make sure that the team is completely taken care of, because again, as I mentioned, the folks that work on our team are people that ran away from everyone else. You know, they wanted something a lot different. And if, you know, for us to even talk merger with a large firm, it, it's like, they're, you know, I could see they're, they're like, oh shoot, now what, what did I get myself into? You know, are we going to go back to the same way? And we had to make sure that that was not going to happen. And so, you know, the hourly bill is still not there. We're, we're still kind of, we're doing things exactly the way that we were doing it prior to the merger. I, I, we felt that uh, an independent unit was super important. We wanted to make sure that we still make, had our marketing intact because marketing drove our business. We spend about 7% of our revenue in marketing and have been for a very long time. And you wonder, wow, 7%, what does that get you? Well, People come to us, they find us, we never go out. So we've never made any outbound calls, outbound emails, nothing like that. Everybody has come to us through thought leadership in, in our industry. And we want to continue to keep that, keep that going. And that kind of blends into number three, maintaining that brand. The, the brand was super important because it was important for a lot of different reasons. For, first of all, all the clients are coming to us. If our brand changed, then where will the clients find us? That was, that was a concern. But more importantly, the, uh, the employees, the team, that, that's how they found us as well. You know, all across the nation, people are looking for Summit CPA Group from Florida to California, you, you name it. We're finding folks from Canada all, all over the place. And uh, with that, we wanted to make sure that the brand stayed there so people could find us so that we could continue to grow uh, with people as well as with the team. And then um, incentivizing the buyout was super important uh, because what I didn't want to do is I didn't want to... And Adam and I talked about it. Do we want to actually sell and then, then leave? You know, is that what we want to do? Or do we have some unfinished business to do? And Adam's 45 years old or 44 years old. And he's like, hey, I can't retire now. I'm too young. And I'm like, okay, let's figure out how we can make this incentivize and see how we can really grow this from a $10 million practice to maybe a $50 million practice in five years. And that's our goal. And uh, with that, in order to do that, we broke it up and had two payments. We had 40% of our, or 60% of our, Incent or, or a buyout was paid up front, spread over five years, and the other 40% uh, is paid on the value year five. So if we grow it to $50 million, you can kind of see how that value really makes a, a huge difference there. And it really gives Adam and I an incentive to really keep going and really keep pushing and even put, put on the gas to make things even go better, which is a win-win a for both, uh, both Summit and Adam and I, our team, as well as Anders. It gives them a, a reason why that they would want us to be there. And then the last thing is we wanted to see at the table. We wanted to be a partner in the firm that we we're coming to. We didn't want to do all of this and then the partners meet and decide we don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> you know, that type of thing. We wanted to make sure that we had a seat at the table so that we could be part of that discussion and, and help out and help guide the ship to, to that. Well, th thanks. Thanks for those um, success drivers there. And one thing I'm just going to encourage people is to download uh, the ebook. We handed out uh, this to the, the people here in person that, and, and look into uh, this story. And you can read about some of these additional obstacles and opportunities uh, that, that you drove forward with, with this, this merger. So one other thing I, I want to highlight here is, and you mentioned th this CAS 2.0 movement, and many of the things that, that Jody has put in place are, are highlighted in our CAS benchmarking survey that we're re we released this week, it shows actually that the firms that are kind of you know operating with intentional strategies, like what Jody just uh, highlighted, have almost double uh, the revenue 
per professional in their firm. So there really are techniques that you can put in place. It's not just about the technology, it's about all the strategy uh, that Jody just referenced. And we're gonna be having a webinar coming up on that. So uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna move to open forum. I, I can tell you the, uh, we've, we've got a lot of uh, questions that have come in, a uh, lot, lot of questions on the, 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 uh, the, the electronic uh, uh, payment item. So, but I'm first going to give Barry you an opportunity because I think you were almost going to jump in just to comment on what you heard uh, from, from Jody's firm and, and the perspective of this merger and, and the thought that, that went into this between the Summit Group and, and Anders. Well, it's, it's very impressive. And, and I think the, it's a really demonstrates the beauty of our profession, really, Jody. I, I think, you know, our profession, we have 44,000, basically 44,000 small firms in this country. There's, you know, a few hundred of them that are pretty large firms, but um, 44,000 firms, and there's not just a way to do that. And, and with technology, the digitization, with, you know, what we've labeled digital CPA, um, and, and the whole notion of how services are evolving and the expectations of clients or niching like you talked about, uh, I think it's a beauty that we, we can be entrepreneurial and still live up to our public interest obligations as a profession, and we can do it in a variety of different ways. And frankly, you told a story of a small firm. I could give you stories on the larger end that firms are, are looking at different ways. There's not just one way to do it. And I think that's the beauty of our profession. Yeah, well said. Thanks, Barry. Well, Lisa, uh, as I said, I think nothing, it got, it was lit up. It was lit up when you started talking <laughs> about the, the 1099Ks coming in. And so lots of questions. We will continue to talk about this. You know, here, what do you suggest for people that, receive payments that are not income, used between families, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So more, more to come on this issue. Absolutely. But, uh, you know, initially the observation is you've got to start talking to your clients about documenting if, if they've gotten um, non-business and business is in quotes, non-side hustle, whatever it is, income through one of these um, processing companies and it wasn't properly marked as personal um, then it's going to get included in that total. So you're going to have to have your clients start thinking about all the funds that they've gotten through those um, through those third party, third party payment networks, and just start getting their documentation together. And then we'll do some uh, you know some digging around and, and get some insights as to what the next best step is. And on that point, before people get nervous, if you look at the sort of the guidance from the IRS, it says. Well, you might want to tell the provider to amend that 1099K. Now, when you read that and see that, you can all this, I can hear and see all the smirks. Yeah, right. That's really going to take place. We know that's not going to take place. And we're, you know, we have that on our list to discuss with the IRS. That is, doesn't seem to be a very successful, you know, resolution to that. Exactly. The other is very important is that you don't have a right of offset in this. So like if you have this transaction and then there's a, another personal transaction, that's a loss, that loss doesn't, it's doesn't get to offset that gain. It's not like right. gain, uh, you know, gambling winnings where you have an offset up up into the to the gain. That's not how the law works in this process. Yep. So new, maybe one final comment from you as we're in the last couple of minutes here. Just as you you've been learning about the digital CPA firm and all the firms in the room and what you just heard from Jody. Oh yeah, absolutely. And in fact, I have uh, one of the things that I noted was uh, uh, well validated some of the things that I'm seeing. Right, um, what he's doing with the hybrid uh, environment and all that. And one of the things that uh, resonated with me is the variable compensation, where I would imagine you you get a lot of flexibility. And and if people want to work more hours, they have the opportunity to do that. If they don't want to do that, they have the opportunity to do that. So sure. hopefully, you'll have time to coach your hockey team. And uh, <laughs> yeah. so, um, but. Uh, it's great to be here and thank you, Eric, for being here. Thank you. And again, thank you for your leadership here as, as digital CPA chair. Yeah, thank you. So we're now gonna kind of uh, cl close out uh, today's uh, town hall. So as we always leave you, we've got, we've got in summary, we've probably covered a few, a few items that are not highlighted here. This was definitely a, a power packed session. Uh, here's the recent town hall series. Uh, we are trying to slice them up. Uh, so you can also leverage, uh, you know, uh, bite-sized uh, components of, of our town hall. Uh, we, Lisa, will be uh, closing out the 2022 year, town hall year, uh, next Thursday. And I appreciate we had 7,000 people adjust to come in on a Tuesday for us. We'll be back to our normal Thursday town hall day. And we'll have with us uh, Mark Peterson from the DC group. We'll be talking about 
a lot of uh, the lame duck legislation that Barry covered. And we also have uh, Stephen Saab from Robert Half, who's going to be talking about, you know, what's going on uh, with hiring uh, in firms. That should be an interesting discussion. And we also have Marcy Russell, who you all know, uh, who's the economist, and uh, she'll come in and, and let us know where, where inflation's going, hopefully, Barry. Yeah, she'll be making a <laughs> prediction, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, so with that, um, would like to thank the live audience uh, for your participation today. Here's the next two town halls, December 15th and January 5th. It's just fantastic to be with you. We appreciate all the engagement online. We appreciate the engagement uh, with the digital CPA community. So look forward to being all be, we, being with you all uh, sometime soon. Thank you very much. Thank you for your participation. You can now subscribe to the AICPA Town Hall series on your favorite podcast platform, as well as watch archives on YouTube and AICPA TV. Tune in for live broadcasts Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time.